posture ourselves in the presence of God this morning as we pray going before his throne of grace. I must say to my family this morning, I've been away for three weeks, but oh, how good it is to be in the presence of my sisters and brothers. I am so thankful to God to be back here. There is no place, there is no place like home. So as we pray this morning, Pray to the Father. We are in His presence this morning. Yes, we are. We are in Your presence, O oh Lord God, for Your Word tells us that You abide in us, You dwell in us, You reside in us. So as we come before the most holy God, our God who is almighty, let us be reminded this morning that we are in the presence. Together, together this morning, we are in your presence, oh God. We thank you for the presence of the Most High. Your Holy Spirit dwells, resides in us. We're never alone. We will never be alone. You will never forsake us. We're never abandoned. No matter what we're going through, we're not by ourselves because the word of God tells us that we're never alone. And for that alone, we say thank you, God. I'm thankful that we're thankful this morning because God of your presence, God, you know our uprising. You saw us when we woke up this morning. And you know our down sitting. You're right here amongst us. You're right here with us in our seats. Every demon like center church this morning. I believe it. We believe it by faith, God, that you are with us. Oh, God, your presence is the presence of the almighty God. It is your presence that you've given us the power to live. It's your presence that you've given us the strength to live a godly life. God, we thank you this morning because each of us, each of us, God, has been fearfully and wonderfully created, fearfully and wonderfully made by you, our creator. In darkness, you created us. There's only one way in our life. There's only one one being Lord. There's only one step in reality. There's only one past that you made. There's only one Shakina breath. There's only one raw dog. There's only one Mika Butler. There's only one Tammy God. There's only one. You molded us and you shaped us. You are the shaping us. Oh God, more the image of your son. God, we're so grateful today that your son, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, the root of David, the root of Jesse. Yes, we believe Jesus Christ is the son of God. He is the living God. So God, we thank you. We thank you for the Put eternity in our 
God, let our motives, let our motives be right, let our motives be pure. Help us, God, as you continue the process of sanctification as we go through. And you're making us better and better each day. Help us, God, that your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. God, we thank you for Jesus for all our sickness, all our diseases. He took away all of our sins and our iniquities. He who knew no sin, he became sin for us. What a love, what a love. And if we love you, God, Give us a heart, a heart of obedience. God, we thank you for this love that you have for us. This love that is unconditional. This love that we ask in the body of Christ that we will be unified. Although we're members, but there's only one body. There's only one Christ. There's only one Lord. And there's only one baptism. Clothed with your love. Help us to care about one another. Help us, God, to be united because there's much work to be done in the kingdom. Help us, God, to be as one in Christ. The kingdom of God suffer violence, but the violence taken by force. And we have been created, oh God. We have been created to do good works unto you. God, I pray this morning that the work that you have done in each of us, that you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And the work that you have done in redeeming like sin, the work that you've begun in Pastor Jermaine Reynolds, God, that you will complete your good work, not just works, your good works until the day of Jesus Christ. So God, we thank you and we praise you. Our soul is anchored in the Lord. Our soul is anchored in the Lord. You are our anchor. You are our rock. And so God, we thank you. This we pray in Jesus, the mighty name, Jesus Christ. The Son of God. So God, we say thank you and we praise you on this day. Amen.
Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you sent. All right, so when we define and we start explaining and trying to figure out what eternal life is, what eternal life encompasses, then we go right here to John 17, verse 3. Like amongst other scriptures, like there are various other scriptures that we utilize when talking about eternal life that the Bible speaks about. But when we talk about eternal life, we go to John 17, verse 3. This is what Jesus says. Now, this is eternal life, that they know you, right? The only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you sent. So what's eternal life? Knowing God. Knowing Jesus. What's eternal life? If somebody was to ask you to know God through knowing Jesus. And why do I say through knowing Jesus? Because Jesus declares in John chapter 14 that he is the way. I, I like y'all know about this good Bible now. He is the way. He is the truth. And he is the life. No man goes to his father except through him. All right, so what is eternal life? To know God the Father through God the Son. Jesus says, I and my father are one. How do we obtain eternal life? All right, we get into all of that as we study the person of Jesus. So that's why we spent so much time kind of just studying Jesus and talking through Jesus. Not preaching at you, but we're coming along on this journey together to get to know and understand Jesus. So who is Jesus? A lot of uh, misconceptions about Jesus and who he is and where he come from and what he looked like and what he talked like. Did he wear cologne? Or did he, like, like all, all of this stuff, right? The last one was a joke, all right? That, I mean, jokes don't tend to go over well, much like Minister Randy's joke. But um, two two. Two things in the beginning that I have outlined for us to know about Christ. One, about his deity. Two, about his humanity. All right? So we believe that Jesus was both God and human. That's a mystery that's hard to explain sometimes, much like the Trinity. But we believe that Jesus is 100% God that speaks to his deity. And then we believe that Jesus is 100% human. Uh, so when we talk about Jesus' deity, the first thing that we identify with his deity is that Jesus pre-existed. Jesus is eternal. Meaning Jesus' beginning can't be traced. Jesus is in cannot be traced. Or in other words, we've heard it said, you are the Alpha and the Omega. All right, church, y'all. All right. <laughs> Isaiah verses 9 and 6 says this, For a child has been born to us, a son has been given to us, his, his, sh his shoulders responsibility for us, and this is what he is called, extraordinary strategists. The different different translation than what we're used to. Mighty God, everlasting Father. So this is three to four hundred years prior to Jesus' being born. The prophet Isaiah says something about the Messiah that would come. He shall be called everlasting Father. Now when the Bible mentions Jesus being called everlasting, it's simple. It is simply saying that Jesus pre-existed as God. So when we speak of Jesus as deity, we speak of him as God because he was pre-existent. In fact, we go on in John chapter 8, verse 58, and it says this. This is what Jesus says when he was talking to those uh, Pharisees. He says, I tell you the solemn truth. Before Abraham was, I am. Why is I am significant? Because we see all the way back in the Old Testament, hundreds of years before Jesus was cracked the scene in his humanity, that Moses has an encounter with God the Father, and he's having a rough time trying to understand this particular assignment. And he's telling God, I, 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 I stutter. 
They won't listen to me. Who should I tell them sent me when Pharaoh asked, whose name do you come in the power of? God's response to Moses back then was, tell them I am sent you. So now as we fast forward four or five hundred years later, Jesus is talking to these same Pharisees that were familiar with the scripture. And they're talking about, you know, you're only, you're not even 40 or 50 years old. Like, how, how, like how, how, what do you mean? What are you talking about? Jesus said, well, I'm going to tell you something. He says, before you, your, 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 your. so the, 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 the Jews at this time, there was two prominent figures in Judaism, Moses and Abraham. Abraham is a prominent figure in just a, in all three of the major world religions. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. They all trace back to Father Abraham. So when Jesus is talking to the Jews, he understands that Abraham is a big deal to them. He understands that Moses is a big deal to them. They would have been very familiar with Moses' encounter with God. And we know they were familiar with Abraham. Jesus tells them when they're trying to ask him questions about his deity and who he is, he said, I, you, I, I tell you what, before Abraham was, I am. Immediately when he said that, that would have that would have took them so far back. Either they would have took it and they would have been like, oh man, like this is power and authority. Or they would have took it like many of them took it and they would have been uh, offended by the statement that he was making. So when people say Jesus never claimed to be God, when Jesus says before Abraham was, I am, he said before Abraham was even born, I was there. Before Moses came on the scene, I was there. In fact, we see in the very beginning of the book of Genesis, the Bible says, um, well, we see kind of the Trinity on full display. Not my sister-in-law, Trinity, but the, the Trinity on full display. Um, it says, let us go and make man in our own image. We see the us symbolizing God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So when we talk of Jesus as deity, we mean he pre-existed as God. Not only do we see Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am, but in John chapter 1, we, we read, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was fully God. The word was with God in the beginning, all things were created by him who's him, the word. All things were created by him, and apart from him, the word, not one thing was created that has been created. And as we go to verse 14 of John chapter 1, we see that the word became flesh, Jesus incarnate, and dwelt among us. So now when we read John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, listen to this. In the beginning was Jesus. And Jesus was with God. And Jesus was God. Jesus was with God in the beginning. All things was created by him, Jesus. And apart from him, Jesus, not one thing was created that has been created. Jesus is God. Yes, Jesus is the son of God separate and distinct from God the Father, but Jesus in his deity is God as well. Amen. Yeah, amen. This mystery, this union, this theological term that we use to describe this union yet distinction is the Trinity. One God who eternally exists within three distinct Beings, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. We see this distinction take place immediately after Jesus was baptized. In addition to what we see in Genesis, when God says, or the scripture says, let us go make man in our own image, we see in, after Jesus is baptized that the, a, a voice comes from heaven. The voice is from God the Father to God the Son saying to those that were present, this is my beloved Son 
whom I am well pleased. So we see a distinction between God the Father's voice and his son being baptized. And then we see Jesus looking towards the heaven and the Holy Spirit coming down in the form of a dove and coming upon him. Three. Three. All cohesively working together as one. Trinity. Somebody shout the Trinity. the Trinity. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 16, this is what we see the scriptures say about Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God. Has anyone ever seen God? No. When have we seen a picture or an image of God, the Father? Through Jesus. The scripture says, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For all things in heaven and on earth were created by him. All things, whether visible or invisible, whether thrones and dominions, whether principalities and powers, all things were created through him and for him. Who is the scripture talking about? Jesus. So the scripture is unequivocally clear when it talks about Jesus' deity existing as God. John chapter 5 verse 23, Christ said, the one who does not honor the Son does not honor the one who sent the son. What is Jesus saying? He says, I'm deserving of your worship. And if you cannot worship me, then you do not worship my father. There's a lot of people that think they can do a lot of things to please God the father. And the only thing that we can see us doing to please the God, to please God the father is obedience to his son, Amen. Jesus, not just a good prophet, That's right. not just a good man, didn't just a guy, a guy that came on the scene just to perform miracles. Jesus himself was God in the flesh. He was Emmanuel. Yeah. What does Emmanuel mean? God with us. Like Jesus bore all of our sins as God in the flesh. All right. You're preaching. Preaching better than they responded, I can tell you that. <laughs> so Jesus is God, yet Jesus is distinct or separate from God. All right. Um, in John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus says, the Father and I are one. John chapter 10, verse 38, Jesus says, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. So Jesus is God and yet distinct from God, um, all at the same time being unified with God along with the Holy Spirit. Again, Trinity, all right? In Revelation chapter 5, verses 11 through 14, this is what the scripture says. It says, then I looked and I heard a voice of many angels in a circle around the throne, as well as the living creatures and the elders. Their number was 10,000 times 10,000, 1,000 times 1,000. It can't be counted, is essentially what it's saying. All of whom were singing with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was killed to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven on earth and under the earth, in the sea and all that is in them, sing what? To the one seated on the throne and the Lamb. Distinction. They're praising the one seated on the throne, God the Father. They're praising the one seated beside him, the Lamb, Jesus. Jesus is always described as a lamb, a lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. So when the scripture says lamb, it's talking about Jesus. To the one seated on the throne, to the lamb, uh, and to the lamb, be praised, honor, 
glory, and ruling power forever and ever. And the four living creatures were saying, Amen. And the elders threw themselves to the ground and worshiped. What do we see about Jesus in his heavenly form? He is being worshipped yes. as God. Yes. And if he's being worshipped as God in heaven, yes. then surely he should be worshipped as God here on earth. Praise, honor, and glory to that matchless name of Jesus. That just describes his deity. But there's another nature, another side to Jesus. That's his humanity. Uh, again, hypostatic union describes Jesus being 100% God, 100% man. In his humanity, we know that he was human because Isaiah 9 verse 6 says, For a child has been born to us. A son has been given to us. Wait a minute. A child was born, but a son was given. Mary bore Jesus in her womb. But he got there because God gave him to her. So the son being given refers to Jesus' humanity. Jesus, as we look at his life, he had human emotions just like you and I. Number one, Jesus was hungry. That don't, that, that, that's not human. That, that, that's human. Jesus was hungry. Fasting for 40 days, 40 nights, hungry. Give me something to eat. Jesus was tired. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, what did he say? I thirst. I need something to drink. He's human. When, 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 when Lazarus died, he cried. He displayed human emotions like you and I dis display. He felt compassion for people. When he walked in Jerusalem, when he rode into Jerusalem, his, his, his heart went out on the entire city of Jerusalem. The night before his death, the Bible describes Jesus being uh, filled with sorrow, almost describing what, what could appear to be depression. Yes. Jesus, wow. in his humanity, laying aside his deity. He never stopped being God in the flesh. He pushed it aside. He humbled himself is what the scripture says. He, he humbled himself and became us so that we could then receive what he offered. His righteousness. We call Jesus coming in the flesh the incarnation, right? God becoming human. Why does Jesus become human? Why is the incarnation so important for you and I? One, so that Jesus could empathize with us. As human beings, there was a disruption in our relationship with a holy God happened in the very beginning with Adam and Eve. When they decided to rebel against God, there was a disruption in the relationship. God being holy could not be in the presence of sinful human beings. And so that relationship was, what, what's the word? There's a, um, that relationship was alienated. It was, it was destroyed. It was ruined. And so when Jesus comes and he is incarnate, he, is, he comes in the form of God and humanity, he does it so that that relationship with God the Father and humanity can be restored. So the, in the incarnation, Jesus put aside his full divine attributes. So there are some people that say, you know, you know, he never stopped being God, and so that means, you know, he had an unfair advantage as a human, right? Like, that's what they said. Like, he had an unfair advantage as a human because he was still God. Jesus, what I'm saying to you is, Jesus lays his divine attributes or his glory aside 
to become human, to empathize and relate with us in our humanity, and to be able to help us when we struggle in our humanity. That's good news. That we serve a Savior, hold on, watch this, who's God. But not so much God that he can't come down and empathize with you and I. That's not so much God that he can't come down and help you in your weaknesses and your struggle. No wonder Paul says, when I am weak, he is made strong. And, and that, there's many of us in here that have had some weak moments in our flesh. Weak moments in this life. Raise your hand. If you just wave them in the air. Wave them like you just don't care. We've all had those weak moments. What the scripture says is that in our weakness, Christ is made strong. That's when his power is on full display. When we're weak. Stop trying to be strong all the time. Sometimes we just need to humble ourselves and say, Jesus, I hand it over to you. And just, and just fall into the Father's arms. Just, just allow him to hold. And, and the, the reason you and I have not fallen away from God is because of the scripture that says, Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling. The truth is, we've tried to fall. We've tried to get away. We've tried to run. We've tried to disconnect ourselves from God. Jonah, when God gave him the assignment to go to Nineveh, Jonah ran as far as he can run. Some of you have been running and running and running and running. And you realize, why do I keep ending up back in the same church or in the same position to where God is speaking to me? He says, stop running Check this out. The fact that you feel the tug of Jesus is something that you should never take for granted. Because there are many who have never felt the tug of Jesus. The Holy Spirit came into the world to convict the world of sin. So there's an element to the world that understands that there's a God that exists beyond us as humans. But I'm talking about something different. I'm talking about feeling that tug of Jesus. And if you felt that tug of Jesus, I encourage you to stop running from him. Embrace him. Turn to him. Because that could be regeneration at work in your life by which the Father is drawing you to him. Right. So, the, the incarnation, in the incarnation, Jesus Christ put aside his divine attributes. Matthew 24, 36 says this. But as for the day and the hour of Jesus' return, no one knows it. Not the angels in heaven, not Jesus. Wait a minute. God knows everything. What are we? Three things that describe Jesus omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent. All powerful, all knowing, everywhere. Well, how does Jesus not know when he's going to return? In his humanity. He laid aside his divine attributes. So the scripture says of Jesus' return, no one knows, not the angels in heaven, except the Father alone. Christ put aside his full use of his omniscience while he was on, while he was on earth. The second reason that the incarnation is so important is because Jesus put aside his independent freedom as God. And Hebrews 5, verses 8 through 9, it says this. Although he was the son, he learned obedience through the things he suffered. And by being perfected in this way, he became the source of eternal salvation.
to all who obey him. Let me read it again. Hebrews chapter 5 verses 8 and 9. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through the things he suffered. This is Jesus. By being perfected in this way through the things that he suffered, he became, Jesus, the source of, not the sources, okay. not the many roads that lead to God, right. as many other people will have you believe. There are many roads that get to God. Jesus, according to the scripture, is the road that gets to God the Father. He became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey who? Him. To all who obey him. To all who obey Jesus. He becomes the road to eternal security with God the Father. To eternal life with God the Father. Through obedience to God the Son, Jesus Christ. How did Jesus learn obedience in his humanity? Even though Jesus was always submitted to God the Father as a man, he learned obedience to God the Father separate than what he learned when he was in heaven. In heaven, he was always submitted to God the Father. He and the Father were one, but he was always submitted to his Father. But in his humanity, he had to suffer. In his humanity, he has to be broken and beat down. And, and the Bible says that during the brokenness and being beat down, he learned obedience to his Father. Why are you don't mean it? That means suffering teaches us certain things about life. Suffering teaches us certain things about ourselves and suffering teaches us certain things about God the Father. All of us should be learning through the things that we suffer. All of us have a story based on what we've suffered in this life that can cause others to be drawn back to Jesus because of the things that you suffer. No wonder the scripture goes on to say what the devil meant for evil. That's what Job was able to say. Like, he's taking all this suffering and trying to break you and hurt you and get you far away from God. Jesus says the things that he suffered drew him closer to God. And there are many of us, when we suffer, we run from God. We run from church or the people of God. Can't be around enough people. See, they just judge everybody. That's the stuff that enemy tried to throw in our head. Can't, can't go around them people. They, they judge everybody. That's the place you run to. Because all of us have something in common in this building today. There's some ugly areas in our lives that we're not proud of. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. All of us have that in common. There are some ugly areas in our lives, in our past, in our present. Yes. Thank you, Sister Sherman. Yes. yes. <laughs> because most of us like to regulate the ugliness to our past. Now, you know, I just lived a bad life back then. There are some bad things that I used to do back then. But there's some bad things that you think right now. And there's some bad decisions that you make right now. There's some evil intentions in your heart right now. The Bible says the heart is desperately wicked. There's yes. something wicked about all of us. Yes. All of us. Yes. The pastor, the deacon, the elder, the mother, the usher, the organist, the singers. There's something desperately wicked about all of us. And so we've sent the wrong message to people outside. We've made them think that there's something good about us. No, there's something ugly on the inside of all of us. The only difference, though, is, is what we go into next. The atonement. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. The atonement is when Christ comes in and pays the penalty yes. for our ugliness. Yes. It, it was a certain type of debt that we just couldn't pay. Like, if we went to church 365 days out of the year and fasted 365 days, 
and, 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 and read the Bible 24 hours of the day and prayed the other time. Whatever the other time is left after 24 hours. Yeah. We're still undeserving of God's love. And so Christ comes and he pays the sin debt that you and I could not pay. Like he comes in and pays it all. I, it, like, when, uh, when, no, when I say paid everything, yeah. like, you have no debt. No. Not in relation to sin. No. You got credit card debt, right? But we have no, we have no sin debt for those of us who are in Christ. None. Listen, listen. You have no sin debt if you are in Christ. Therefore, there is now no condemnation to those of us who are what? In Christ. For those of us who are in Christ, there is no sin debt. Do you have sin? Yes. But there is no sin debt. You don't, you don't pay the penalty for your sin any longer. Why? Because Jesus bore the penalty on his shoulders when he was hanging on the cross. That's the whole significance of the cross. While he was hanging there, your sins and my sins and their sins and their sins all was on his shoulders. If he bore our sins, guess what? We don't have to bear them. Every whip, boom, every crown of thorns, every beating, every scoff, every scorn was God's wrath being poured out on Jesus that you and I deserve. God would never pour his wrath on Jesus and then pour the wrath out on those whom Jesus purchased. Jesus' punishment was powerful enough to where it, it what was the scripture? Like it, it's from, it, from everlasting to everlasting. Like it's so, it's so powerful that it, it, it keeps us in our past, keeps us in our present, keeps us in our, in our future. So when we talk about atonement, we talking the sin that was that was paid that you and I could not pay. So that's why we go hard for Christ, because this is the other side to the sin that was paid. That was paid. You were purchased. So, so you can't take the sin debt that's available and then live according to you because you are no longer your own. You were bought, the Bible says, with a high price. It, it almost likens it to a slave that will never be able to get out of slavery because you'll never be able to make enough money to be able to buy your freedom. But then somebody comes on and buys your freedom. So you're free. Who in the third set free? free? You're free. But you're free to serve the son. So when you come out of the, the, the shambles of sin and life, you're free. But you're free to serve the son. And so when we talk salvation, we always say salvation is a free gift from God. True. But it wasn't free to God. It was free to you. But it wasn't free to God. God had to sacrifice something for your sin debt. God had to give up something for your sin debt. God had to, God had to let something go that he cherished for your sin debt. And he sacrificed his son. And he sent his son down what we used to say 42 generations. And, and, and he put on human flesh. He was obedient unto death. He was crucified, buried, went down to the depths of the earth. Some people say he went down to hell. There's no passage in scripture that says he went down to hell. But he went down to the depths of the earth. Right? We call it uh, Sheol, the place of the dead. Goes down to the place of the, to, to the depths of the earth and begins to preach to those that were captive. And, and then he's resurrected from the grave on the third day. And when he gets up from the grave, he says something astonishing to his disciples. He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. So this Jesus that we serve, once he got up from the grave, he got up with all power in the palm of his hand. You don't just worship a good prophet. You don't just worship a good man. You worship the king of kings. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Never 
Nebuchadnezzar, Julius Caesar, none, none, of, none of the great kings of the past, if you put them all together, have nothing on the king of kings. That's why when we look at our relationship with Christ, this is not a democracy. Jesus and you don't negotiate the terms and the conditions of the contract. You don't sit down with Jesus and say, well, I'll do this, Jesus, if you do this. You know, we've all said, God, if you get me out of this situation right here, yeah. just get me through this. Just get me out of this relationship right here. Woo I promise you, I'll serve you all the days of my life. If I wake up in the morning and I ain't got, and, and, and that bill is paid, God, oh, just, I don't know. Like, like we, we are always negotiating. We, we don't negotiate with Jesus. The price that was paid was his blood on Calvary's cross. The terms are full obedience to Jesus. The, the, the price, his blood that was shed. Now when, you, when, we, when we do communions and we sing songs like the blood that Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary, like when you think about it, man, it hits different. Like, man, way back on Calvary, the blood, that gives me strength from day to day. It will never lose its power. Thank God it reaches. I, I wish I knew how to. To the highest mountain. And it flows. I'm, I'm done. Let's sing that song. I'm done. One need to come lead us in that song, please. This, this is how we go. We don't end the sermon abruptly. One need to lead. If y'all never heard this song, listen to this song. For it reaches it. to the highest mountain, and it flows to the lowest valley. Oh,
uh, on, on Wednesday night. So I encourage you all to get on Zoom for one hour, seven to eight o'clock. Get on Zoom from your homes and, and participate in Bible study. Uh, so perhaps there are some of you all in here that are trying to figure out why we all excited and why we all happy. Uh, it's because we are in relationship with Jesus. And he saved us when we didn't deserve to be saved. He saves us continuously when we don't deserve to be kept. Yeah. And he's going to keep us until he returns yeah. and puts all things on you. So our eternity is secure in Jesus. We don't go to sleep at night on eggshells thinking about if something happens to us, where are we going to go? We know we're going to be with Jesus forever. The question is, do you know? If Jesus has been tugging on you, this is your opportunity to respond to that tugging. I give you a chance now, if you want to respond to the tugging of Jesus, maybe you don't want to come all the way to the front. If you want to come to the front, come to the front. If you want to respond, slip your hands up in the air and we will get with you immediately following service. I think it's bigger than us praying a prayer, right? Like, I think the prayer is necessary. But the Bible says if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that Jesus crucified, buried, and raised from the dead, you shall be saved. Nowhere does it ever say if you sit down and begin to pray a prayer. Right now, I'm not, I'm not telling you not to pray the prayer. I'm just telling you that if you confess Jesus, salvation is available to you. But you have to be, you have to be disciples. You have to be taught what it means to be a follower of Christ. You don't have to be taught so that, you know, you can earn salvation. It's free. You want to be taught so that you can walk worthy of your vocation. You can walk worthy of the price that was paid for your sin. So if you would, come to the front, come to the front, come to the front, come to the front. Pastor Charlotte, come up here with us. Shakita, come up here with us. I think when, it, when whenever you got young ladies that come up, it's important, or, or ladies, it's important to have other ladies rally around. Godly women rally around. When you got brothers to come up, godly men to rally around them. Because the truth is, this journey was never designed to be done alone. Like, none of us are going to do this alone. That's why we still come and we gather on Sundays, is to sharpen and build each other up to grow in our relationship with Christ so we can go out and put, put the world on fire. Is there any that want that, that uh, just slip their hand up right where you are? You slip your hand up right where you are. Uh, 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 somebody, Pastor Charlotte, let your kids stay there. You go over there with Trinity, Pastor Charlotte. Oh, bro, Doc, come over here with Darius, please. Come up here with Darius, please. The Lord has been working on Darius for a while. And I'm telling you, this brother is rock solid. His wife is rock solid. I've encountered them on several just little small occasions. They're rock solid and God is going to do something extra, extra special in all of their lives. So we we, we rocking with them, with him after service. We rocking with her after service. Just, just talk, just talk, just talk. But I'm going to pray. Father, for those that have come, we say to you, thank you. Just, just thank you for this opportunity. The Bible says that when one sinner returns to God, the angels in heaven rejoice. And so God, I thank you for the angels that are rejoicing in heaven over one that returns. God, I pray for their lives, that their lives would have so much more meaning, purpose, because their identity is wrapped up in Jesus. Jesus, we love and we praise you. In Jesus' name, let the church say amen. amen. Say amen. amen. Put your hands together. Bless the name of the Lord. Rod Doc, make sure you get with Darius immediately after service. Shakina, make sure you get with her immediately after service. Same with you, Pastor Charlotte. Listen, so this is where, this is where it shifts from 
just religious social gatherings to something spiritually actually taking place in all of our lives. If, if it's not spiritual, then we just gather for another social gathering on a Sunday morning that we can do any night or any morning. This is when God is at work, the Holy Spirit is at work, and there are times in which after we're done here, we still minister. We stay at the altar, we go into the office, we sit in the car, we get on the phone, and we do the work that God has called us to do. So this is what I'm going to do. This is how we're going to close us out, because I'm going to close us out in the same way. Uh, I know we have announcements, uh, which is vacant. The main one is Vacation Bible School. We're starting Vacation Bible School, not next week. Wait, next week. When is Vacation Bible School? Oh. Uh, the 18th through the 22nd. So if you've not registered for Vacation Bible School, it's, it'll take place all week here at the church. Bananas last year. All right, it's, it's not like this. Like, it's just register for Vacation Bible School. Young to the oldest. Like, we want everybody here growing that week. And then we'll close it off with a picnic or a barbecue of some sort. That's, is that the only major announcement? All right, cool. And uh, offering. This is how we're going to do the offering. We're going we to honor the Lord in our giving. We're going to worship the Lord in our giving on your way out. Um, you might do it on your way home or whatever the case may be. But utilize Cash App, PayPal, Easy Tide. Or if you want an envelope, slip your hands up. One of the ushers can grab you an envelope and you can fill that out as we're closing service. Once you want it, once you fill it out and you put your gift in there, give it to uh, Deacon Jerry in the back. Any of the deacons in the sound room, give it to them on your way out, and they'll make sure it gets taken care of. Is that cool? That works, Shakina? All right, cool. Father, I thank you so much for this day. This is the day that you've made. We rejoice, and we're glad. We're going to leave this place, but never your presence, rocking out with Jesus. Now unto him who is able to keep us falling and present us faultless before his presence with great joy. To the only wise God, I say it. Be magic and dominion power both now and forever. Let the church say amen. Amen. amen.